Yeah, this is one of my favorite creepy pastas. It's an empty prison. It's kind of long, so get ready. A single day added on to my sentence meant the difference between a normal jail and the unending nightmare of Pembina prison. I was supposed to get 364 days. That was the deal. But the judge didn't like my attitude. Whatever the hell that meant. So we made it 365. Boom. One year was the minimum for prison. My lawyer made a stink and a half, but it didn't do any good. It, it's not his fault. In fact, he's the one who's going to release the statement to the press or leak it online if the Guardian Corrections Group or GCG tries to get an injunction on us. People have to know what happened at Bambina Prison. I'm going to put it right out there and tell you that it was haunted. I think I'm joking, nuts, or lying, but you have no idea. Haunted prisons aren't anything like you imagine. Those places that advertise themselves and give people tours are sick jokes compared to the real things. It, it got so bad that you can actually look up GCG's official little filings for Chapter 11 that put them out of business on their very first prison. And, and right there on the briefs, using an early statute of North Dakota law from 1857 to file an insurance claim. It says, site of Pembina prison confirmed by governor's office and two notary publics, witnessing in person to be afflicted by the su supernatural such that continued business is impossible. It wasn't the first time the prison was closed for that reason either. But they just kept buying it and reopening, hoping to make a buck off the common man. And I was shoved into that hellhole without knowing the history even a single bit. Don't don't get me wrong, the, the building itself wasn't so bad. Especially for something straight out of 1853. It, it was a big stone cube that was squat, heavy, and cramped. But way less sealed off than modern prisons. We could see a lot of the cells around us. There was one main hallway per floor, and we were close enough to pass things between the bars and have some real human interaction. It could have been worse. There were five floors in capacity for 500 prisoners. When I first got there, I had a bunch of cellmates, and I heard there were 2,000 guys locked up, and I believed it, but that soon changed. I didn't talk to anyone for the first few three weeks. I'd never been to real prison before and I was messed up over it. I didn't want to accept that I would be in the place and stuck with three other guys and myself for an entire year. The whole prison seemed full of feral men. The bottom floor would start screaming and panicking in the middle of the night all at once. We were on the top floor but we could hear their screams opening through that open old layout like they were right there with us. I thought prisoners on the bottom floor were nuts until the guards weren't there to wake us up the first day of my fourth week. When I woke up in my corner without some asshole guard banging on the bars of our cell, I finally had to ask one of my cellmates, Dante, what was going on. And I'll, for, and I'll never forget the fear in his voice as he said something that should have made us all incredibly happy. The guards are all gone, man. The prisoners were talking quietly between the cells and loudly between the floors through various whispers and shouts. But we could mostly figure out that something on the first floor made them all quit in protest. Sure, sure, must, must have been the crazy screaming like that during the night, right? Except none of us could get any word from the bottom floor. It was dead silent down there. The guys on the second, on the second called out for hours. Someone was down there, they said. Because they could hear shuffling footsteps walking around at random every so often. But whoever it was never said a single word. That was the first time Dante mentioned the crazy stories from the first floor. He muttered that he hoped none of that was true. When I asked him, he just shook his head. Nothing, man. None of it ever makes sense. We were a little worried as the day wore on and nobody came to let us out for breakfast. Then nobody came to let us out for lunch. The time we usually got to spend outside in the yard came and went, and people began getting restless. In the cell to our left, Dante's friend Will began telling guys to press the word that we should all calm down and start sharing any food we, we had hauled away. I remember asking Dante, is it really that bad? 
the nine meals in your time for a day or two before. He told me. Well, the other guys in our cell didn't look convinced. One of them said, but not like this. They, they made damn sure we knew what we did. They, they never just up and laughed. Someone handed us pe pieces of crusty old bread through the bars. It was much appreciated that the new guards didn't show up for work for another full day. We got plenty of yard time that day from these new guys. They seemed more confused than us. We, we all watched from a distance as Will asked a guard what about what happened. The guard shrugged. I don't know. GCG was play, was praying, paying a premium for fast hires, so I signed up. What about the prisoners on the first floor? We, we could hear them shuffling around down there. We looked out on the way to the yard, but we couldn't see anyone. Huh? The guard frowned. Nobody's in there. They, they all got transferred. Transferred? How does that mean? It means DOCR took them back, returned them to state comp custody since the company couldn't handle them. That made sense. If the floor had been full of nut chops and North Dakota's first local private prison company hardly had the experience to handle them. But these guys didn't even have the skills to handle us. There were half as many guards as before, and they didn't know the routines or who was dangerous among us. As a result, they were distant, scared, and forceful. All except one guy. Kellen. Kellen wasn't the first guard to treat us like human beings. But then again, he was the only one around. He traded jokes around the yard, never hit us, and looked us in the eyes when he talked. He went and found some paperwork to confirm the crazies had been actually transferred. It took three months to get that info out of GCG. By the time he, he told us he'd heard back, we sort of forgot about the whole thing. Two nights later, maybe two hours past the lights out, the guys on the second floor start screaming. Dante leapt up and fell on one of our cellmates by accident for shouting, No, 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 must be a fire. Other guys in our rows began banging on the bars and shouting for guards, but the uniforms charged past and headed downstairs without talking to us. We could hear them shouting orders down below and then yelling in confusion. The prisoners' screams were clearer than coming from the second. It sounded like they were terrified of something in particular and wanted help. The sounds of gates being slammed and people running reached us after about ten minutes of shouting. And then it was silent. We sat in the dark, waiting until morning. When the new shift came in, they were surprised and confused, and Kellen, Kellen came by to ask what had happened. We told him what we knew, but he'd shown up and found open gates in an empty second floor. There was no indication of what had happened, but he promised to check with corporate and figure out if the absent pres prisoners had been all rapidly transferred again. Dante, Dante gripped the bars and made sure Kellen was looking at him. Please, find out who the hell is walking around down there at night. Kellen blinked at that. I mean, I'm day shift, so I, I don't know what I can do, but what do you mean? The prisoners are gone, Dante told him fiercely but quietly. But the guys on the third floor said they still hear someone, maybe two or three sometimes, shuffling their feet every hour or so till morning. I guess I could go look right now. Dante reached through the bars and grabbed his uniform, something which usually got us a beating. Hear me. Do not go in there by yourself. Stay in the stairwell unless someone's with you. Kellen nodded, nodded fearfully. It looked like he finally understood how spooked we are. He waved another guard off and let Dante go, or, and Dante let go, sorry. But nothing came of it for a whole season. The night shift had quit and more guards got hired at an even higher pay. Kellen and another uniform got scoped out out of the first two floors. Sorry, I messed that one up again, sorry. <sighs> oh, sorry for that. Uh, Kellen and another uniform scoped out the first two floors, but found nothing. Dante thought it was because they were looking during the day. But he wasn't about to ask our only friend to risk himself. It was maybe three months later. Yeah, I, I was halfway through my sentence. I had taken up drawing, so I had a pen and paper. When we woke up in the middle of the night, to everyone on the third floor screaming in absolute panic. 
this time when we're less scared during the event itself. Will offered a guard racing past 500 bucks from his commissary account if the man would come back and tell him what was going on. Dante listened intently, trying to hear individual screams from the first floor over everyone else's shouting and confusion. I wrote any words that I he thought he heard. What I wrote down, Jesus Christ killing him, God let us out coming this way. We weren't as scared when it, we weren't as scared when it was happening because we'd lived through it twice before, but this time the long term fear was much deeper. Now we knew for sure that it was going to happen again, and any prisoners that had the means began lawyering up and doing everything they could to transfer to other prisons, even if it meant worse conditions. The problem was, the North Dakota prison system was already overflowing, which was the whole reason GCG got started in the first place. So every guy out meant that it was harder for the rest of us. Both of our cellmates transferred, giving us more space, so that was nice, but it was small consolation. Apparently word had started to spread on the outside, and GCG's solution in staying, instead of paying the guards even more was to stop having a night shift at all except for just one poor guy. Kellen was a bit miffed. He hadn't gotten a raise out of the whole thing, and he was starting to believe the thing that believe us that something was going on. By then, he'd been around a while, and he knew that we weren't liars. Too many other prisoners told him that they'd heard something walking around the first, second, and third floors at random during the night. It was just a few steps, sometimes as many as 20, but it only happened every so often, and only once. And, and only once it had been long enough that you thought it had stopped for good. One guy on the fourth floor said he'd heard a full run from one end of the third floor hallway to the other. Clear enough that he'd expected a guard to come charging up the stairwell, but nobody had appeared. He slit his wrist and got transferred out on medical leave the next day, so we took him serious. All that was all that was enough to get Kellen doing some research on the outside. He came to us in the seventh month in our in our he came to us in the seventh month of my sentence with a pale face. Beside us at the bars, Will asked, What's the word? Kellen seemed grim. A lot of crap out there, but this place is mentioned a lot. It's been closed before, but I keep getting stonewalled when I ask for historical documents. Thing is I don't think the prison itself is the problem. Get this. He pulled out a notebook for reference. Two Canadian priests, Father Norbert Provencher and Severe Dumalin, visited Pembina in 1818, before it was even an official township. That was back when the Hudson's Bay Company was big around these parts. That's how it was. That's how long ago it was. Pembina was the biggest town in North Dakota then, so the training post was full. So the priest chose to sleep outside by where the Pambina River meets the Red River. The folk tales has it that a vision of a rotting woman came in the night and stole Provencher's life. The two men bartered with her to split the remaining life between them. Co-signing both to live 35 more years instead of 70, Sabir had left. Sabir got an extra month and 20 days of the gift from his friend for his sacrifice. He paused. As if we might guess the obvious outcome. They both died 35 years later. I knew Pem being a president had a horrible problem, but that didn't mean I had to believe any of everything. Let me guess, a month and 20 days apart? Kellen nodded. Dante snorted. It's true, dude, Kellen insisted. The dates of the death are right there on Wikipedia, but guess what? 35 years after 1818 made their deaths, made their death year at 1850. Three, the year this prison was built, and the place they cat a camp right night that night by the meeting of the rivers. I didn't know what it meant, but I was beginning to feel uneasy. It's right here, isn't it? He's dead serious. I think there's something here. Ancient ancient stuff. That's the guy I know. He's got Chippewa relatives over at Turtle Mountain. They know the history of the Red River better than anyone else. He said his uncle told him to never 
sleep at the meeting of the Red River and the Pabina River. He said something lives there. Other, other, under the ground, awakens with the changing of the seasons. We were silent for a beat after that. It was folktale nonsense, but it was, it was as good a theory as any. Whatever it was, it was going to come back, and it wasn't friendly. We'll talk to Cal for another few minutes, but Dante was silent. After he was gone, I asked him, What's wrong? He sat on one of the now unused bunks and told me, I got another five years in here. I ain't got no money for a lawyer. The sentence will be up before it reaches us, and I'll be here alone. Will it? There, there was no way to be sure. It'll be back in two months for the fourth floor, and then three months after that for us. I could get out a week before or a day too late. It doesn't seem to be too exact. I just looked at the floor. What I mean is, I do hope you get out before it comes. Oh. I wasn't sure what else to say after that. So I sat in my corner like I always did. It wasn't too much after that we heard GCG was going under. The mad rush of transfer had pissed off the state and, the, and lost the company a vital contract for a second location. An investor had pulled out or something. The number of guards were cut, were cut and then slashed. And Kellen took a pay hit to stay on as the only guy on the day shift. There's only two prisoners that left on the fourth floor. He told the 20 of us remaining as the general week we expected it to happen approached. I feel like I should stay late and see what the hell is going on down there, but the former guards I ask about it are all terrified as hell and refuse to. Some got violent just because I asked. It's cool, Mill told him. You got a kid at home, don't be here for it. The Twenty of us left on the 50th floor, sat in our cells one, once night fell, praying and listening. On Monday night, nothing happened. Two guys down below occasionally shouted out to us that everything was clear. On Tuesday night, nothing happened. The strain was growing through, and we could sometimes hear them breathing rapidly down there. I could only imagine the adrenaline rushing through them every minute until dawn. On Wednesday night, nothing happened. Yet something had changed in the ear, the air. The prison was much quieter now. No more than 2,000 men had become 22, and I thought I could feel a subtle, soft heartbeat in the air, pounding against reality like it was a thin sheet of paper. It's just your imagination, Dante whispered. None of us were willing to speak louder than that. On Thursday night, the heartbeat became a feeling of footsteps approaching the great distance. Guys! Will shouted from the cell. Y you good down there? Still here. One responded from down below. But I can feel it. it. It's at the door. It's knocking. How's that supposed to mean? They didn't respond. Friday night. That was the night it wouldn't happen. All day, two guys on the fourth floor pulled and clanged on their bars, begging to be let out. Kellen was torn. After two hours of listening to that pleading, he came up with an idea and transferred both of them to our floor. If nobody's on the floor, then we'll all be safe, right? Out loud, we agree, but we were kidding ourselves. When the night guard showed up, he freaked and took the two men back down. He said out loud, what were you thinking? If nobody's on four, then it'll just come right to five and get us all. What the hell was Kellen thinking? I had to listen to hours of sobbing that evening. It was the hardest trial of my life. I wanted to call out to the night guard. I wanted to ask him to get those men out of there. But if I did, I knew what was ever coming would find all of us instead. The moment it happened, it was like a cold hand on my shoulder. What's going down? What's going on down there? Dante shouted. The men. The man who's not sobbing called back. It, it, it's changing. Will demanded. What's happening? Tell us. It's red. R red? It's red. What's red? Will, Will yelled instantly. What's red? 
We stared down the hallway at the night guard who stood listening with fear. The screaming began a few seconds later, this time only one floor above. We could clearly hear their every word. The sobbing, pr the sobbing prisoner shrieked there. It's there. The man who had been communicating with us became, uh, became incoherently raging with fear against his bar. And strangely, he stopped. Twenty of us clung to our bars, unable to help, unable to flee. Many of us cried, but we were otherwise silent, for the yell would to drown out the last words of the men below. But they were eerily quiet for nearly two hours. We waited in strained silence as random footsteps traversed the fourth floor every so often. What was happening? For the first time, the victims of whatever was going down on there and below had chosen to be quiet instead of yelling for help. Why would that make things difficult? At long last, the sobbing man broke the silence. Oh my god, it's coming your way. Shut up! I'll see you distracted! Hit your bars! The sound of clanging echoed up the stairwell. The sobbing man said with terror, It knows! It knows! Jesus Christ, do something! We were no longer silent. We echoed that sentiment loudly and repeating to the guard, do something. He just stood there, literally quaking in his boots. We we'll screamed at him, snap out of it. The other guards and prisoners got away. You can too. Whatever it is, it won't follow you if you let them out and leave. I shouted, they're going to die down there. Dante threw his shoe and the impact finally snapped the man out of his terror. The guard ran, ran down the stairwell and descended. The first thing we heard was the taken aback and Mary Mother of Christ, the stopping man again. Over here, for God's sake, let us out. The other prisoner wasn't talking for some reason. We could hear his gasping terror, but that too went quiet. Then we heard a buzzer. All the gates on floor slammed loudly open. The sound the sounds of panting and running and someone dragging some, something followed. The prison went silent. And just like that, we were alone again. The formerly crowded prison now felt terrifyingly large and empty with only 20 of us and no guards. That night, the unmistakable sound of footsteps echoed from down below. I counted time as best I could, 40 minutes, and someone took the broom three steps out of a cell and into the hallway. An hour and six minutes, someone ran ten steps along the hallway and stopped abruptly. Twenty-eight minutes, footsteps approached the stairwell, but then into a cell and went silent. Thing was, whoever it was sounded barefoot, and then and the starting and stopping locations did not match. Where they ended was often nowhere near where they began again later. By the time dawn came, we were scared into motionless, terrified silence, and it took Kellen's arrival for us to begin stirring again. With GCG bank in bankruptcy court, we no longer had a night guard at all. If it came for us, there would be nobody to let us out of ourselves like everyone else. We hardly talked. We hardly ate. Each passing day was a grain of sand. Falling, and falling through an hourglass, marking our executions. Our fellows began confessing to crimes they hadn't even committed just to get transferred to Supermax out of state. The only option left, well, that and suicide attempts. One by one, Callum escorted or dragged guys out of our floor. Twenty became fifteen, then ten. And it was just me and Dante, with Will still in our cell to the left. The three of us, and Kellen, four men, waiting for doom. We sat playing cards in the weeks leading up to us. It would be one full year for me in that place, but I could swear I'd spent a lifetime in that cell. I couldn't think, couldn't remember life before, couldn't imagine surviving after. Every day, I prayed for a transfer to come in, but North Dakota had gotten sick of us, and judges had stopped hearing cases from them being a prison. They didn't know there were only three of us left. Nobody knew. We contacted the media. We phoned governor's offices. We made a ruckus. That was worse than nobody knowing. It turned out nobody cared. 
too. There was nobody higher up at GCG following the situation, and Kellen couldn't get anybody on the phone. Payroll, meaning just his paycheck, was being handled by a third-party disbursement company that couldn't answer questions about the ongoing proceedings. The week approached. On Monday night, nothing happened. We were like statues in ourselves, alone, waiting for a sign of the executioner's approach. When dawn came, we sighed and began moving again. Dante asked, you get out Friday? I nodded. If things went like before, I would be released the day of. As long as I left before sundown, I would be all right. On Tuesday night, nothing happened. Two for two, just one more, just one more day. I sat through the darkness until, no. The feeling of the prison had changed around us. A subtle heartbeat seemed to pulse against our faces and ears. It had come a day earlier in the week than last time. That morning, Will patted me on my arm as we both leaned out of the bars. Sorry, man. Dante just shook his head early. I wasn't going to get out in time. On Wednesday night, the heartbeat became the sounds of footsteps approaching from some unfathomable distance. I think I stood at the bars of our cells that entire day, fingers wrapped around metal with force to match the tension in our air and in our minds. This couldn't happen. This wouldn't happen. My lawyer would, t would walk in and tell me he'd gotten the judge on fair addition of an extra day removed. One day. One day. Even if I spent the whole year in prison, one day still meant life or death. Let me out. Let me out. For God's sakes. But nobody cared. And nobody would listen. I'd like to tell you that Kellen stayed late that night. I'd like to tell you that when the entire floor began to grow, glow red, the hallways, the cells, the stone itself as whatever ungodly abomination in, in the earth began to wake upon the changing of the season as distant foot footsteps became a traveler at the door of our minds, I'd like to tell you that Kellen was there and hit the button and opened the gate and let us all out. I'd like to tell you that I didn't see anything, and that I'm not a permanently broken mind. Man, I didn't caught the, the walls of my cell as it approached slowly, moving a few steps every 20 to seven, 70 minutes. I'd like to tell you that all three of us were able to run away and escape that horror upon reality, with its rotting hands and blind eyes radiating, radiating crimson light at its, as it searched for us at random. But I can't give you a satisfying end to this, to this story. The disbursement company fired Kevin and Kellen and changed the locks on the property. According to the paperwork, all the prisoners had been moved. They thought he'd been getting paid for guarding an empty prison. They left in us for 11 days before the error was found, which meant 11 nights with that thing. For 11 days, we starved for, for 11 nights. We sat it absolutely still, not daring to move or breathe or even look left or right. It knew we were there. Generally, it stood right outside our, our cells for hours and sometimes walked right through the bars and grasped at the beds around us, daring us to even make the slightest motion. You spent six straight hours staring into the blind, crimson eyes of a rotting, rotting demon, unable to blink your eyes for the fear that it would hear the eye, the air in your lashes move. When you've seen what it's seen, the worlds it has walked reflecting in its hellish red, you'll understand. No one cared. I'd like to tell you that Kellen actually existed. I'd like to tell you we had a friend among the guards. And that it wasn't all bad. I'd like to tell you I wasn't traumatized by the hell I went through being left to rot and left to die as nothing more than a number on some corporation's books. But nobody cares. And that's the story. That is my favorite creepypasta. So yeah. Yep, that, that's it. Uh, thank you for joining me while I read this very long thing. But I, I did enjoy reading it. So yeah, yeah. That's about it, yeah.